Hey, well, I'm happy to be joined by Gloria Wong, an emerging developer here in the Twin Cities. And Gloria has been acquiring, renovating, and managing properties here in the Twin Cities for about 30 years now. Um, Gloria, thank you for, for joining me. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Thank you for the interview. And thank you for wanting to come um, this morning to talk to me. For sure. So I know that you've got some big projects planned, especially an affordable housing project on White Bear Avenue in St. Paul. And I want to ask you about that. But first, I wonder if you could, I gave you a very brief introduction there. wonder if you could Tell us a little bit more about your background in property ownership and management. And uh, it sounds like you've been doing this in the Twin Cities for, uh, like I said, 30 years now, since 1994. Um, tell us about that and, and how you got involved in this line of work. Well, I I started, you know, with an HUD in the old days back in 1993, 94. I was just freshly got out of college, um, married, newly married. And so back in the old days, it's hard. And then I, I'm really interested in like flipping homes uh, with my husband. He was, and he is still very capable and very talented when it comes to, you know, like flipping uh, old junk homes into like a brand new home. We didn't have too much money and then we started from, you know, for nothing. Uh, and we were sleep there. We'll go buy this hard home, like 27,000, 30,000, 50,000, 68,000, all kinds of price. And we was just flip it. And we didn't have any kids uh, the, the first seven years. So all we do is flip it, those old hard home and renovate them and resell them or rented them uh, right after we, you know, rented those uh, after we renovated those very damaged properties that we bought. And my my hand, my husband, like I said, my husband was very handy. And as in since I'm really small, I'm under five feet, skinny, like a hundred pound, ninety eight pound. So when an area like heights really high, we we own several properties that is really like built nineteen or six, eighteen ninety, and it's really high. my husband's scared high. So when it comes to send someone way up the third third floor, I would be the one. And if we have to change like a water heater, my husband will like send me into the little you know little things, and I would go in there. And he will help me get in there. Well, I would be the one that tuning stuff and put stuff in. And so I'm handy in a way that because I'm small, skinny, my husband's little like muscle built. So um, that's how we started. And I, I think the reason I started hard home back in the old days in rental properties because I came to this country as a refugee kid. I was 10 years old when I came to this to America, there were eight of us and rented, can only rent for one bedroom. And all of, some of us will have to sleep on the sofa, on the floor, in the bedroom. And so I, from my background, I was a refugee. I came to this country with nothing, and escaped communists, you know, saw a lot of death along the road as a kid, seven, year, seven and a half to eight years old. Um, I left my uncle to die in the jungle too because he stepped on a landmine with, with nothing. Um, I was raised by the white mom. Uh, just ambitions of me wanted to live the American dreams. Living American dreams, you have to work hard because my white mother would always say to me that, honey, well, people in Europe say that we work very hard. American people work very hard. I didn't I, I didn't process it during, when I was a teenager or college, but after college and got married I realized that well you know I wanted to have the American dreams I took like courses in college like business and management prop management courses and love business so that's how I become a um, business rental property commercial properties yeah. until now I guess because of my background that's uh, quite a story it must have been you said you were 10 years old when you came here and and what country did you come from Laos among people. Oh, okay. Yes. That must have been a, a harrowing experience, quite an experience coming to a brand new country 
at the age of 10, but at the same time, a lot of opportunity here. Yes, yes. And then was I was fortunate enough to was raised by a white white single mother in Edina. And I think that she she taught the the quality and the the helping, you know, people with less fortunate. And you know, I I built that because I ran a adult daycare and a home care. My home care I started because my grandfather was in a nursing home at East Bethel used to be, I mean, is is used to be called East Bethel by Liberty Plaza, the public housing in that area. He was beaten up. He was there for three years. He was beaten up from the waist and paralyzed from the waist down. He died five months after that. So um, I, that's why I started my home care. I did not want, you know, the elderly or disabled um, people or vulnerable people and, and my culture and going to nursing home not understand that the language will not be able to eat the, the white food and you know um wanted to go home and I, I i visited my grandfather um many times in the nursing home you know uh, my grandfather was um a chief of a village uh, in back in laos he was in a in the uh, army, my dad was too. Hmm. I, <clears throat> yeah. So a little emotional when I talk to him about my grandfather. Yeah. So I so I started my home care agency because of my grandfather. I wanted the most vulnerable and disabled uh, and their 20 years to be cared by their elderly, I mean, to care by their family members if they can. And then I started the adult daycare for people who are just home, cannot drive, cannot speak the language. And then from there, I got people in the community like needed help. Uh, wanted they they wanted my help, so they will they will come to me and ask for help. Like when I like the children are unable to care for them or uh, let continue to have them living in the home because of their disability. So they will come to me and ask for me to help them go to, you know, go to public housing, go to Wilder Foundation a property and fill out the application and have them live in the property. I did that for many years, but then for the last nine years, I am unable to do that because we are lack of housing. So the their like multiple times that elderly uh, uh, came to me and I cannot, they, half of them were disabled and then I cannot send them to a shelter home because they don't speak English, they don't, they cannot write, I mean, they cannot read, they cannot eat the food. And so they, I, what would I do? And you know, I get stuck for like days and weeks with, you know, vulnerable people. Sometimes I took them in in my house for four or five days. Sometimes my employee took them in until we, until they get uh, find their other family member for to put locate them, so I and then I have like you know homeless pe people, vulnerable people come to me like three, four, five years. I mean three or four, five times a year. This year, February first, I just have an elderly came to me, and you know and was very emotional because she got kicked out by her boyfriend and her boyfriend's children and so she said she heard the good thing that I did for the vulnerable and you know most uh disabled people she wants to come to me for help and so you know I felt like okay I, I after the pandemic there's so many homeless people uh disabled people that kicked out by their children that their children can I continue to provide, you know, a safe place for them, Noah? So what do they, the children do? Kick them out. And they, they came to me and then private housing just didn't take application anymore because they just, they just don't have space. And yeah. so I cry along with, you know, um, the most vulnerable and disabled people. And I felt that there's a need for, you know, the um, most you know, disabled and vulnerable people. And I started, you know, to look into, you know, um, something, you know, with, with that I can, you know, if they come to me, I can say, well, you know, I have one, you know, if, why don't you put your application down, you know? So I think in Minnesota, I'd be lack of housing for, you know, you know, a lot of people, family with children and uh, 
disabled people. And yeah. so I went to the city, I went to the elected official and then, you know, being um, asking them or uh, telling them my story uh, with my adult daycare, with my home care. Uh, and so then I was very fortunate that in former council Dai Tao um, was in my Ward 1, which was host my commercial building. Uh, and I, I, you know, told my stories to him. I wanted him to help me, you know, uh, wanted him to refer, you know, this and that person to me. And he did. So now I finally, you know, went to the city of St. Paul and, and um, told them my vision and my you know, and my love and my passion. And, you know, I think, I think somehow the city of St. Paul, you know, truly see the passion that I have and the, and the mission that, that I serve, that I wanted to serve, you know, my group of people. Well, it certainly sounds like you're doing great work and have been doing great work in the community. You identified a need, you're a compassionate person and you're, addressing a big need in the city and, and, and elsewhere throughout the Twin Cities. So good for you. Just by way of background, um, I I understand that your businesses that you referred to, there was the uh, Heritage Home Health Care established in 2002 and the Lifestyle Adult Day Center established in 2012. Um, Gloria's two businesses employ more than 650 people here in Minnesota and provide support to elderly and people with disabilities. And so um, that's, you're, you're certainly addressing uh, a, a great need there. And, uh, you know, I, I commend you for that. One, one, one thing I wanted to ask you about was the, in 2016, you acquired the Century Plaza building at 995 University Avenue, 65,000 square foot commercial building that you own and operate. Tell me about that and um, what led you to purchasing that building? Well, both of my business are growing. I need space for both of the business. Um, dog dog daycare, we ended the lease in a hotel and we needed, we needed a bigger space. We have, you know, the business are growing. And then the Century Plaza was owned by one of my husband's cousins. And he had owned it for 20 plus years, I think 20 years before I, before I took over. So the people came to me and asked me, well, you know, do you want to buy Sunrise? It, previous name was Sunrise Plaza. And I say, what? Okay, yes, I would love to. And they wanted me to keep it within a community. There were a nonprofit there, uh, insurance agency there, a little store, restaurant, deli. And they, so all people, because we own it for, when I took over, they own it for 20 years. They want, you know, the community to still um, hold that. It, they were, the previous owner was um, a Vietnamese person, and the the, the group, the most of the group inside or the renter inside are Hmong people, and they want another Hmong owner. So they asked me if I'm interested in that, and, but they, it's it's a short sale. I had like the owner had thirty days more days, you know, for redemption, you know, to redeem the property. And I told him that, you know, can you redeem the property for me? And, you know, I paid you, you know, extra for redeem the property for me. So the owner went and redeemed the properties and I turned around and bought it from him. Mm -hmm. And that's how I inquired the Century Plaza. But then back in 2020, after George Freud, uh, the death of George Freud, I got looted um, and vandalized, mm. uh, so it was pretty bad too. Um, I had the the looted and vandalized has gone until the fall of 2021. Um, we got like shooting th three different shooting times. One was the door in the back, and one was. The, the very beginning, May 28th, they came and shot three windows. And then um, right around the summer of 2021, uh, we got two windows, two windows got shot, 
too. And during, during May, you know, 2020, um, we have bought up the whole building because it's, you know, vandalized pretty bad. The 50, 60 men went through 11 minutes and they just try, you know, from the first floor to the second floor. So my husband and the, like I said, former uh, Dietau, former council Dietau came with like six, seven people, helped us clean up the glasses, board up the whole building for uh, six weeks, eight, six, about six weeks before we can go back to, you know, to um, get the, the building mm. because of the other glasses. Everybody wants glasses, you know, during that time. So our builder were unable to get glasses within six weeks. So we shut down. We shut down by the governor on March, March 16th until May 28th. And then we shut down from May 28th until middle of July before we opened. And I know that it was really hard, you know, for my husband and myself, we were shut down from March until May and then vandalized, looted. We got shut down until May, July before we can go back to, you know, operate the uh, business. So it's hard. I mean, life is hard. I mean, I, I didn't think that I would be able to come this far because, you know, I, I lost so much money. Uh, the pandemic is bad enough, but in the looting, the vandalized, it's terrible. So, I mean, I didn't think that I came this far. I didn't think that, you know, I will be able to, you know, do anything, you know, because of the hard time uh, that I went through. Yeah, a very, very difficult time. And tell yes. us, how you got, how did you get through that? Well, you know, with with good saving, you know, that I have, um, be able to make the mortgage payment, um just you know just being wise and you know when it comes to in being business the tax was a hundred and six thousand during that time too and now my tenant pay rent because they didn't pay rent they didn't pay they pay march but because we shut down middle of march until june and then and i tell them Mar until middle of you know until the last march the last month of may so then they felt like oh, they don't pay April, May, June, and it comes, and, you know, the pandemic, I mean, it comes the George Floyd damage. So they, and they, July, they don't pay rent. So my husband and I comes to, you know, to conclusion, we just like, okay, okay, how about, everybody had problems, everybody had struggling this time because of the business, because of pandemic, but they now it's a George Floyd, we didn't think that we got to get, you know, damage, you know, because it's an old building, have not renovated the outside, just finished the inside, but then there's store inside, church inside, Delhi. Uh, so they came with their car jack and, you know, that my car jack and the cement block to, uh, to, you know, to break in uh, because it was very well um, renovated. And so they took the cash machine out from the store. Um, people, people, I thought that they targeted me, you know, because I'm a business woman owner. Uh, my my neighbors from south and west east from me, they didn't get the damage. They didn't get, you know, like the school, St. Paul School were next to me. Uh, Santai was opposite from me. And they didn't get the damage I did because, you know, I felt like, you know, because I'm Asian, because I'm woman owned business. And so I, so I felt like I've been targeted, you know, until the fall of, you know, 2021, until the, uh, their traveling case over and people would come to the building to, Pee, poo, you know, homeless people, and they will they go to the store and they will drink in and the film. Them. I have good cameras, so when the, when they they went to the store and drink those and you know um Korean and drink, they would just splash on the wall, you know. I mean, kick the wall, splash on the wall, damage the floor, the the glasses. So I thought that they they truly have a vendetta, uh, you know, against me. You know, for 
being a woman owned business in Asia too, because one of the police officers was too tall. And I don't know. I mean, yeah, hopefully, those, hopefully, at least some of the people who did that damage were held accountable. But how did how did you rebuild and how long did it take you to rebuild? Well, you know, it took us a long time. I would say about three years, almost three years. We were lucky enough. Um, you know, you asked Senator uh, Tina Smith, um, you know, office called me in the summer of 2020 and asked, if I want to, if I need help, I say, yes, I do. You know, my off, my office, my building had not opened up. I give, you know, I give my tenants, all my tenants, you know, a break too, you know, because they went through a hard time. I went through a hard time, you know, all our business was shut down for four months, four and a half months, you know, because of the George Floyd. I felt, I felt that we lack a leadership. That's why the George Floyd, you know, death and, especially in the police force. And so that's why small business like us went through so much. Um, so I think, you know, so you, you asked Senator uh, Tima Smith to call me and, you know, um, they'd be able to give me some loan to um, EDL, uh, SBA, and that's how we are able to rebuild and regain what we had lost. But, you know, I we still right now, um, we still, you know, we still like facing, you know, the loss Yeah, we haven't like fully recovered, you know, all the loss that we, we had. And we are able to get some help from, you know, the deed for, for all the tenants. And um, then I, I also apply through, you know, um, mainstream grant and I got 185000 uh, to renovate the outside and all the windows. So my husband just replaced the two windows that got shot um, two years ago. He just got that replaced like a month ago or two months ago. And I think I think it will take us, you know, a while, you know, to, to really recover from all the losses that we that we got, you know, um, people, people went through pandemic and that's very, very bad. Okay. Mm -hmm. Terrible for, for us, for some of us, like the, the, in Minneapolis, the right street into the Mayway area, you know, we gone through pandemic and then George Floyd, the death of George Floyd, mm -hmm. we gone through a lot. Yeah. And just, coming from where you came from, coming here as a young child, escaping violence and a terrible situation there, only to have to deal with something like this in the United States. I, I can hardly imagine what that must have been like for you. Um, just anyway, well, I, I'm glad that you're, you're recovering and doing some good things. And I wanted to ask you about I guess on a more positive note, um, I I understand that you're planning a uh, mixed use project with some affordable housing on uh, White Bear Avenue in St. Paul. Um, I believe it's 87 units. Yes. Lurieville project. Tell me about that and what's the status of that project right now? Well, my 87, you know, housing, affordable housing units in the east side area is called the Hapner site. Mm -hmm. I was in, I was aiming that property for a long time. And then me going through so much of homeless people. And like I said, the most vulnerable adults that are looking for housing, I truly have a passion and I, my passion was, you know, to do something for kids and family, small family, and, you know, um, senior. And so I, they, I also wanted to create jobs, you know, um, by wanting to do something different in the East side. I know that a lot of, you know, wealthy, a big, big man, you know, 
like um, rich, um, you know, RJ Ryan, I think th these wealthy multi-millionaires um, developer, I don't think they, I don't think they're interested in the East side, you know what I mean? But a lot of, you know, my people are mostly can afford in the East side area. So I wanted to create jobs in the East side area because I, I feel like the East side area where Hamlet side, where I go to build my glory well, needed, you know, like a, a store, a convenience store, like um it's not going to be that fancy like lawns and berries but you know i'm hoping to put like um like a cup foods uh you know and, and that kind of store in in the bottom and then put deli put you know other uh in in the store so that i i create jobs for um high schooler or college you know because i i also have wanted to put studio in the glory well studio one bedroom two bedrooms three bedrooms so that you know so that you know people who cannot afford that one one bedroom two bedroom can be in a studio college student because i was a college student before you know you you don't have you poor you know you're on the student loan you're on grants you're on scholarship and so then they can have a place to come home and go downstairs, especially the vulnerable adult. They can just go downstairs and get their groceries, you know, and come come back up. Or they could call older and they will, you know, take it to them. They don't have to worry about, you know, take a bus or, you know, uh, call I mean, the family member. Like I have a vulnerable, my mom, my dad, my mother now, is 91 my dad is 94 my dad is blind my dad is disabled from the world world and so you know like someone like my mom my dad cannot drive so let's just say if i you know someone like that you know can just like call and say you know i needed this and that and they could speak more directly to us too and for people who like a non-speak english we had interpreter my husband he spoke you know a little Chinese, he spoke Laotian, French, English, Thai. So my husband spoke like seven languages that, you know, he can easily help translate. And that's what all the years that, that I need a translation, he'll be the person to translate for me, you know. Um, and I don't have to use, I save the state money too by not using inter interpreter, a lot of interpreter. I did it mostly, I did it myself. Um, my husband helped me. So for the, the first, for the first seven to nine years, I didn't have to use interpreter at all of all my, my business. I used myself as an interpreter and my husband until um, it's complicated. And that's when I started to call like Camton interpreter, you know, to help in, to help interpreter, but before that, I did it myself with my husband. Yeah, well, you have a lot going on there, and just by way of background, the Gloryville Project, uh, 1570 White Bear Avenue, which is in District Two Ward Six, a little over two acre site, uh, 87 units of affordable housing would include some high priority homeless and people with disability designated units. Um, it looks like you've got a number of uh, fun, some looking at 25,000 square feet of commercial space on the first floor and uh, so including some uh, 20,600 square feet will be a grocery store that will provide culturally relevant products to the surrounding Hmong and Asian communities. Sounds like a really good project that you've got some potential financing identified, low-income housing tax credits, Minnesota Housing Finance Agency, DEED, Ramsey County, city HRA funds. Um, and hopefully it looks like you'll be able to start construction as soon as August of next year. Is that right? From Well, from you know, I, I, you know, right now, if I get all the funding, um, I think right now my consultant uh, putting application, uh, you know, through you know, MHFA, Minnesota Housing Finance Agency, with 4% tax. Hopefully, 
hopefully I got awarded, you know, being a woman mm. developer, um, mm. emerging developer. I we like I said, you know, I'm going I'm going with a developer as a passion, you know. And my passion is I mean, a lot of vulnerable, disabled adults, uh, homeless people, um, family. And like I said, you know, I love creating jobs, you know, because that's what I've been doing for the last 22 years that Heritage has been in business, Lifestyle has Lifestyle Adult Day Center has been in business. And even though you not every business that, you know, you got profit from it, but when you, with your passion, and the God will see either way and God will award you, you know, um, in, in return, uh, positive in return. And so I I just, like I said, you know, I, I felt like the East Side needed someone like me with a passion, a creative jobs in the community, you know, create like a, a Asian American store for the community. The, and I had doing, um, community engaged last year and I plan to do again you know this year with their with their camping with their um pray is that you know they wanted a store that they could just walk in and buy a gallon of milk and leave so I got a lot of input that you know they're excited about glory Rose is coming in in that area and I'm gonna bring in you know store um housing and so the people in the district two and war six were were really excited about glory well coming in the area yeah mm -hmm. well good luck with the project gloria you've done a lot of great work you've overcome a lot of adversity uh hats off to you for just keeping plugging away and doing good things in the community and i i wish you well with with your project so um just, yeah Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so you. much for this for this, you know, um fantastic interview. I like I want my story to to be out there because being, you know, a small woman in business, um, I truly have a passion. And my passion is that, you know, for people who are less fortunate, um, who are who are not able to, you know, um get what they want or or you know their uh, lack of resource and um so I'm that I'm that person I'm that person for people to come in and you know need help um yeah. um I, I always reach out you know the best I can I will go my way out above and beyond for people who need needed my help well, they're fortunate to have you as a friend, your community. We're, we're all fortunate to have you here doing good work. So thank you again, Gloria. I, w I wish you well, and hopefully we can chat okay. again soon. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. That's, Take bye. care. Yeah, thank you. You too. Bye. Have, have a good day. Thank you. <clears throat>